say you said it earlier about that you never did an internship in college and neither did I and I feel like I'm a stereotypical like liberal arts student I have a chemistry degree yet this is the work I do so anything is possible <laughs> um, before so I'm here today to talk about Priya and I'm sort of curious the Prison Rape Elimination Act Are people aware of what Priya is a little bit kind of sort of not at all okay um, so what I thought I would do is um, kind of give you a big picture about Priya first and then drill down a little bit more specifically about juveniles and adult facilities. Um, feel free to stop me as we go along, any questions that you have. Um, and actually I'd be sort of interested, you came today, you sort of knew what the topic was. Were there questions that you had, like even just coming to this afternoon that, that you were curious and hoping get answered? Yep. I was at the last yeah. roundup. Okay. Was Okay. Focused on girls, and I didn't know too much about that either. I was just very interested. Okay. I wanted to just keep learning more. So. Great. Okay. Yes. Well, based off of your um, biography, I was interested um, in you talking about your experiences interviewing and uh -huh. how you approach that. How does one oh, okay. prepare for that situation? We talk about how um, there's trigger warnings in universities to avoid triggering someone's bad mm. experiences, and how does it feel to directly talk about that? And, right. Um, how are um, the individuals you're talking to preparing for these experiences, how do you use these? That's a great question. Okay. Um, it's kind of something different that I wasn't expecting based off okay. of the information I saw online. So. Sure. Okay. Great. Anything else? Okay, so we'll just get into it. So, um, and I did, I'm happy to share these slides. So if anyone is interested and you want them afterwards, just let me know. Um, I can certainly have them go through to Francesca and you guys can have them. Um, so like I said, I'll do big picture about Priya and then I'll talk about youth and juvenile facilities. I do also have in this slide deck um, information because frankly there's more research that's been done about youth and juvenile facilities. Um, and so you can have, I don't think we'll get to that today, but I, I put it in there in case you all are interested in that after the fact. Um, so I want to kind of do big picture, like I said. And so just to give you um, what Priya is, it's the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And you'll, and I don't know if you'll experience this at all in your work, but you know, sometimes I, um, we, even though Priya, and I'll get into the passage of it, you know, started in 2003, I still have jurisdictions that will say to me, but it says prison. We're not a prison, we're a juvenile facility. So clearly it doesn't apply to us. Well, that's actually not true. So um, that's just what the legislation was called. We all know that, you know, the legislators may not, um, have the full scope of things like who this will eventually impact and so um, as it says on here it affects every kind of confinement facility in the US so prisons jails juvenile facilities um, when I when I talk when people will ask me like well what do you do for a living and I tell them they'll say like oh so you mean like men and male facilities I'm like no no female facilities juvenile facilities you name it any place where someone can be confined as part of their interface with the criminal justice system this the standards apply um, and so, I'll, so basically what happened was in 2003, legislation was unanimously passed by the House and Senate. When was the last time that ever happened, right? Um, and it was, and the idea was to create, um, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was created and so it, it allowed for a few things. So there was a creation of a federal commission um, and this federal commission was tasked with developing national standards. There was also um, financial allocations to do research about the issue, um, and it also provided funding for grants and that sort of thing. Um, and so one of the things I did when I first came to DC, fresh out of college, or fresh out of grad school, was I um, got hired by the Vera Institute of Justice to, um, we got hired to help the federal commission. Um, they were struggling a little bit in the development of their standards, so in um, the, the Priya Commission was created early 2004, um, and we started providing them technical assistance in late 2006. So they'd been working for a couple of years, but not making a tremendous headway. Um, and so we worked with them for a couple of years. Let's see, I think my next slide has more of a timeline. Um, and we um, helped them to develop the standards. Um, and these were draft standards. And so what happened was in June of 2009, um, the commission sent their standards to DOJ. Um, and Department of Justice, per the statute, was supposed to review them and in one year's time promulgate the final standards. Well, you can see from the timeline, I don't know, I wasn't a math major or chemistry, so my math is okay, but between 2009 and 2012, it took a little bit more than a year for those standards to actually come out. So it wasn't until May of 2012 did DOJ promulgate their final standards. Um, and they, they mirror very closely what the initial, uh, uh, the commission standards were, but there were some differences. So for example, um, the Priya Commission really felt strongly that 
uh, department are ICE detainees, so Immigration Customs Enforcement individuals who are held in adult facility or in facilities sometimes, that those should be covered by PREA. But they don't fall at Department of um, uh, Homeland Security doesn't fall under Department of Justice. So DOJ said, sorry, we can't do that. Um, you know, they, they also changed things like instead of making it all of community corrections, which is a very big universe, they narrowed it down to just community confinement. So some place where someone would reside or, you know, sleep um, as part of their um, sentence. Um, and then, so the standards came out in May. Um, there was a 90 day grace period, after which time um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, it became mandatory that they comply with the standards. And then everyone else had a year's time um, to get on board, if you will, to start implementing the standards. Um, so a couple of things though, is that there's, people often ask me, well, well what's the penalty if they don't comply? Um, so Federal Bureau of Prisons are mandated. The only other carrot and stick, if you will, is that at the state level, so any facility, adult or juvenile, that's under the governor's operational control, so it can even be facilities that states contract with um, to hold inmates, that those facilities, if um, they're not found to be compliant, they can be subject to a loss of 5% of federal funds, um, and federal funds specifically earmarked for, for criminal justice purposes, which includes, an, includes a number of, um, I think there's like two or three grants under Department of Justice, but it also includes um, funds from the STOP Formula grants under the Office on Violence Against Women, um, which is an interesting piece because I think people think just criminal justice, but it does also have um, implications around violence against women funding. Hi, welcome. Sorry. Oh, it's okay, you're fine. Um, so a couple of things. So people will say, well, it was well, initially it was very black and white. You're either in compliance or you're not in compliance, and there was no wiggle room. But the reality is, is that some of these standards are difficult to come into compliance with. The youthful inmates, you know, youth being held in adult facilities is a perfect example of this, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but so what happened was, is they, they said, okay, well now you can either say that you are um, fully in compliance, so there's no penalty, you can choose not to submit anything or say we're not in compliance, then you lose that 5%. Or you can give an assurance. Most states and territories are, are submitting an assurance saying we're working on it. So what this means is that instead of losing that 5% funds, which does no one any good, now that 5% is earmarked for PREA implementation purposes. So for example, with the Office on Violence Against Women funds, those stop formula funds, if they are earmarked if they're part of the assurance and they're earmarked for PREA, now um, you know victim advocacy organizations need to use that five percent funding to either you know work on their systems for interfacing with um, individuals who have suffered sexual violence in detention, or partner with correctional facilities somehow to help with the implementation of PREA, um, with in terms of that's how they use their funding. Um, the other thing, just quickly, is that. It, the checks and balances too. Oh, so let me back up. So there's the 5% penalty at the state level. No other penalties exist. Um, so I think that poses a challenge, right? Like jails, no one's, you know, Department of Justice, the FBI isn't gonna come knock on their door and say, are you in compliance? That's not the case. I mean, I think a lot of it is around saying, okay, well, if you're not in compliance with these standards and something should happen to someone that's in your custody, you're gonna face a lawsuit. And Michigan, I can't remember who's from Michigan. Oh, Francesca's from Michigan. I mean, there's been a huge class action lawsuit about women in the Michigan Department of Corrections who've been sexually assaulted. There, there are lots of cases, Alabama. I mean, there's lots of cases around this. Um, so, so there's no penalty except for the state level. Um, and then we also have an auditing process. So there is an audit to be in compliance, technically to be in compliance with the standards. There's one standard that says you will be audited. So it's one of these like catch 22, like if you're not audited, you're not technically in compliance with all the standards. It's sort of a funny one. Um, so there's a three-year audit cycle. So what's supposed to happen is that um, every three years, an agency, so let's say a state department of corrections, their agency, all the facilities in their agency will be audited at least once. And what they do is they, the standards say that they should be, a, a third of every kind of facility should be audited each year. Um, this August, we're actually reaching the end of that first cycle um, of the audit and so then in August 20th 2016 we will start the second three-year cycle um, so technically all facilities should have been audited by August 19th 
But the reality is that isn't actually going to be happening. And you don't have to feel like you have to write all these down. I'll, oh, yeah. I'll share them out. Perfect. So, okay, good. Um, all right, so we kind of went over that. Um, so there has been a lot of effort. Um, this is an, PREA itself is an unfunded mandate. Um, so while, you know, everyone up on the Hill was super supportive of it, you can imagine the resistance that was felt by those that actually have to implement the standards. And I still get, I get calls all the time from people who are just learning about PREA. Mind you, the standards have been out since 2012. And they are, you know, they feel like their backs are up against the wall because they don't know how, what to do with some of these standards because they don't have the funds, um, you know, to, to implement some of the standards. And when we get to the the one about youth in adult facilities, you'll you'll see why. Um, so one of the things that was also funded was the National Pre Resource Center. That's where I work. Um, it's a cooperative agreement with the national uh, between the National Council on Crime and Delinquency and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. So what that means is that we basically, I mean, we're in constant contact with them um, multiple times a day, in fact, to you know anything that we decide to do, we have to get their approval and sign off to do. Um, but we do everything from, you know, Francesca mentioned that I manage the training and technical assistance, so we partner with a number um, of organizations to help us respond to needs of the field. We develop resources, you know, we hold webinars, um, you know, all the materials on our website are free of charge for people to use um, we we also the in terms of the auditing process we train the auditors um, and so this is to help them go out um, they're, they're certified by Department of Justice to go out and audit facilities to check about whether or not they're in compliance okay any questions about sort of big picture on Priya yes sir standards but the, the commission did um, I was curious if you could give some examples of what those standards looked like um, sure in terms of you know uh, one of the standards uh, as sort of like an example yeah sure so we can um, here we can jump ahead real quick and I'll show you okay so here's an example of a standard so there's about 50 a little over 50 standards for the adult prisons and jails so there's um, four sets of standards. So there's a set of standards for adult prisons and jails, one for lockups, one for community confinement facilities, and then a set of standards for juvenile facilities. The reason being is that, you know, there is a lot of variation in those kinds of facilities. Um, and so they thought it was important to make as best, <laughs> the best effort, I would say, to making the standards specific to those kinds of facilities. Um, sometimes jails complain that, well, why, are we, why do we have to comply with the prisons? You know, why are we lumped in with prisons? We're so very different. But they're close enough. And, you, and if you read into the standards in great detail, there, is, there are nuances that, are, um, that kind of break things out. So if they are a jail versus a prison or based on their population size, um, there, there are those um, accommodations, if you will. Um, so the standards are basically a set of instructions for this is what you will do. Um, topics include, um, like big picture topics, uh, prevention, uh, detection, monitoring, um, medical mental health, training, um, I'm trying to think all the categories, investigations, data monitoring. That, I mean, there's a lot of different categories and some have, like under the training, let's say, um, training and education, there's a staff training standard, standard, a standard for training contractors and volunteers. There's a standard for training inmates or residents, depending on what kind of facility, um, specialized training for medical mental health staff and specialized training for investigators. Um, so it really is, the idea being that if we can, that it's not just about I mean, it says Elimination Act, right? Like we want to eliminate this from even happening at all, but there's, we can't just jump to that. There's steps along the way. So if we work on prevention, then we work on detection, like we've got to even know that it's happening. So there are a lot of standards around reporting. Um, you know, prevention, detection, response, like how are we then going to respond when someone um, says that an incident has occurred? Um, and then data monitoring, how can we check to make sure that things are, are actually working? Does that help answer your question yeah. a little bit? Um, and we can, we can jump to this one real quick just to give you um, a framework of one of the standards. And this is um, for the youthful, inmate, the youthful inmate standard. This one is specific to adult prisons and jails. Um, and because it's looking at individuals who are under the age of 18 that are housed in adult facilities. 
Oftentimes, this means, um, so this is obviously in jurisdictions where youth can be sent